So I'm going to talk briefly about kilns, electric, and gas, and also about pottery wheels, manual and electric, and, and may, brief mention about maybe some other equipment, a little less common, but maybe pug mills and mixer mills that people might want to get into. Welcome to the Potter's Roundtable, a monthly podcast where we share our passion for the ceramic arts and a collection of topics specific to potters. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Enjoy the show. And I guess one of the points to make is that when I, and I bought a lot of used equipment over the years, um, there are some features that I think are really important to look for, depending on you know, specifically what the equipment is, but that are important to look for, and others that are less, not really critical, but they're more convenience features. So when I'm looking at a kiln or I'm looking at a wheel, I'm, there are certain things that I, I definitely want to look at in terms of the condition, and there are others that are just, for example, like whether the wheel, let's give an example, like whether an electric wheel is reversible. To me, that's not a critical feature, but it can be handy sometimes, or if other people are going to use the wheel, they might want to you know, use the throw in the opposite direction. I don't consider that a critical feature, but it's certainly handy, you know, so it's a, it's a convenience. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was that there are a lot of brands of equipment that have gone out of business over the years, since the 1950s and, and from then on, and that doesn't mean that as used equipment that they're still, it's still not good equipment. I mean, one example that stands out is a company called Alpine, and they used to make a lot of different kind of really heavy duty equipment, both pottery wheels, they made kilns, they made all kinds of studio equipment. I think it was largely sort of based at institutions and schools. Really good quality stuff. Um, I had an Alpine wheel that I bought. I had, we had over at Hood, we still have an Alpine kiln. Um, it's almost indestructible. Um, it's great equipment. So just because it's, it's no longer being manufactured it doesn't mean it isn't good equipment or it doesn't mean you can't get parts for it. I mean, another example is like Crusader kilns. Um, when, when Crusaders first came out, they were, they were le considerably less expensive than a lot of the other more well-known brands. And they're still available, especially as used equipment. You'll still see them. And there's nothing wrong with them. They're fine. You can get, for a lot of this equipment, you can still get parts. You can, for kilns, you can, for just about any kiln, you can still get replacement elements. As long as you know the make and the model number, there are companies out there that have all, they have all the specifications for them. You can get elements for them. And a lot of the, a lot, a lot of the older um, electric kilns that had manual switches, you can, still get, you can still get replacements for the switches. So there isn't much that can really go wrong with some of these older kilns. There's nothing wrong with them anyway. So don't, I guess what I was saying is don't be discouraged if you, you know, if you haven't heard of the brand or if you think, you know, or if you know for a fact that maybe the company is going out of business. That doesn't mean that it isn't, you know, it isn't usable equipment. Okay, electric kilns. Well, usually what I do is, you know, one of the things I, th I think to do is, is to, when you're, if you're considering buying a used electric kiln, is first of all is, is to ask yourself, is the size good for whatever your needs are? Don't be, don't be lured in by the price. Somebody might, might, they might have a great price on a huge kiln, and especially if this is your first kiln, um, don't necessarily be, be, a, be absorbed by the fact that the price is great and, and it's a bargain, because if it's, for example, if it's such a large kiln and you're just starting out, you may not get to fire it very often. And it might be much more practical for you as a beginning potter or at any, whatever stage you're at, to find a, a size kiln that accommodates the work that you're making or that you anticipate making, or the, si or, you know, the, the amount of work you're gonna make. You don't wanna have to wait months between five, if you only make a little bit of work, and it's, a lot of it's small, let's say mugs or small dishes, you don't wanna have to make, wait months between firings because you won't get the feedback in terms of learning how to operate the kiln, and then when you go to glaze firing, you won't get the feedback and, the re and see the results that you're getting from your glaze. So the size is important, not just the price. The other thing that's really important to look at when you're looking at a used kiln is what's the power source that the kiln was designed for? Because there are two types of kilns that you'll see out there used. The, the, the normal one, when I say normal, that would, yeah, you would use in a home studio would be single phase 240 volt. Single phase, a, a, Brenna, a phase which is abbreviated as phi, but it's single phase, 240 volt. That's, that's suitable, that's the kind of power you have in your home. But there are also kilns out there that were designed for industrial or commercial settings, and those are three phase, 208 volt. And they're not, they're not completely interchangeable. 
And a lot of, for instance, a lot of schools and businesses, and depending on where they're, especially depending on and industrial and commercial ap applications, a lot of those facilities have three-phase 208 volts. For, for high usage of electricity, this is actually a less expensive, more economical form of electricity, three-phase 208 volts. And that's why a lot of businesses and heavy users and industry, use, is, a lot of it is this, if not even higher voltage. But the problem is that if you try to run um, a if you try to run a two a three phase volt on one on, they're not completely interchangeable. We had a, we had a situation, for instance, at Hood where Hood had somebody had given us a 240 volt kiln, but we tried to set it up Hood where it had 208 and the kiln wouldn't reach temperature because it's not getting the voltage that it needed. Okay, so and you can you can you can but so it's just something to look at is to make sure and they'll on every electric kiln there's a small identification plate they're not they may only be like an inch by three inches or something not very large but on every kiln there's a, a little ID plate that in addition to the model number and the serial number it'll tell you what power requirements it is. The other thing to look at is what's the amperage that the kiln requires, because you may depending on what your house or the location is. You want to make sure that you can, you can, that amperage is available. Some of the larger kilns, for instance, now are drawing 60 and 70 amps, some of the larger electric kilns. And the question is, can you get a line? Do you have power available? Let's say in your house, do you have enough, enough lines free that are in your circuitry that you can add a 70 amp line? That, then when I, if, I'm looking at a, if I'm looking to buy an electric kiln, one of the things, the first things I do before I get too specific is I just look at the overall condition of the kiln and I ask myself, was the previous owner or the previous user careful? You know, were they careful with it or they were kind of careless? So I, for instance, what, one of the, to me, one of the telltale things is what kind of shape are the bricks in and the lining? I saw a kiln once that I went to look at and the person that had re been removing the shelves, they must have hit the wall with the shelves every single time they put a shelf in or out because all of the shelves were dinged and dented and chipped, obviously from being hit with something unloading or unloading the kiln. So the minute I saw that, I thought, obviously, I don't know what else I can't see, but the person obviously was not careful when they were handling the kiln. So are the bricks, you know, do they look, you know, is it reasonable wear and tear on the bricks? I also look for corrosion and staining around any openings. I look around like the peep holes, around the top of the lid, around the kiln sitter, if there's a kiln sitter, is the, is the kiln highly corroded? because that means that a lot of the electrical, especially if it's older, some of the electrical connections may be corroded, and it just, you know, it means that the kiln was invented properly when it was being used, if there's excessive corrosion. So again, that means extra, maybe, hidden wear and tear on, on, the, on the kiln. Um, I look at the elements, and I look at them to see, first of all, are they in place in the grooves or the holders on the wall, and also, are the coils of the elements evenly spaced? Because if the coils have gotten unevenly spaced, it means that either they've been replaced and they haven't been replaced properly, um, or, th or there's something going wrong, something going wrong with the way the, the kiln is operating. Because the, the, the spacing of the individual coil should be fairly consistent all the way around. So I look for that. Um, I look for, obviously, things like cracks in the lid. And as you're probably aware, when you're firing an electric kiln, you should have a bottom shelf in there that's raised up slightly off the bottom of the kiln. So I always lift up the bottom shelf and look at the bottom of the kiln. Are there any cracks in the bottom of the kiln? And a lot of times, you know, if, there's, if it's covered, you wouldn't necessarily maybe do that if there's a shelf sitting in the bottom, but lift up the shelf and look at the bottom. And I also look at the condition, if it's a kiln that plugs in, not all kilns plug in. Um, kilns that take higher amperages have to be hardwired in. But if it takes a plug, Pull out the plug and look at the face of the plug. Between the prongs of the plug, is the plastic discolored or are there actual cracks between the plug? Because that's, that's, that's getting close to, that's, that should be replaced if you, if you get to that point. Because that's where the, it can arc between the points. So look at the face of the plug where the points are coming up. Pull it out of the socket and look at it and see is it, is it black or brown discolored? Are there any cracks in the plastic? What it means is, and, it, you, and if you've already had a kiln, you're probably aware of this, that when you fire the kiln, the, the, the plug gets warm or hot, depending on how, you know, how, how good the insulation is. And that's okay, and it's meant to take that, but if it gets too hot, then it can break down. And the, the, the instances where I've heard of fires starting from electric kilns have all been from the plug. Um, another, some general things, like do all the elements work? One of the, there's, there, there, there are a couple of easy ways to, I mean, if, if you can rely on the person, you know, if, if you can trust the person that you're buying it from and they say, yes, they all work, great. 
But one, an easy, one of the easy things you can, what I've done before is take a little piece of paper, like a little piece of tissue paper, toilet paper, and just t a tiny little pinch and just tuck it in each element and then turn it on and see if the, if the, see if the, if the paper starts to char or burn or smoke. If you don't, and the, alternatively, you can just turn them on and wait and see if they all glow red hot with a kiln empty. And see if, also, when you, if you're doing that, if you're looking at them, look and see if they all get to the same color. If you set them all on medium or high or whatever you set them on, you're just going to stand there, like maybe you're talking about it, so when you first come in, you turn all the elements on and you just look at the elements. See if they're all glowing the same, roughly the same temperature, because that tells you something about the, the relative age of the elements. Um, another thing I even look for just is, is, the, is, is the kiln instruction manual included with the kiln? Because to, to me, that's a sign, if the manual is still there, that somebody, again, sort of cared about the usage of the kiln and they took, they took care of the kiln, if they still have the, if they still have the manual. Is the kiln furniture, something to ask specifically, is the kiln furniture included in the price of the kiln? And the kiln furniture is the posts and the shelves. So is it included with the kiln? And if so, what kind of condition is it in? Um, one of the things I found years ago that's a nice little trick is that especially if you have kiln shelves and they're old and you're not sure about the condition, if you knock on them with your knuckles, you can hear whether they're cracked. Because you'll get like a buzzing sound. If you knock on it and you get kind of a nice ring with your knuckles, you'll, you can tell that you, you, you can almost spot you know, cracks that may be even too small to see with your eye. And you can hear them. So I just, I just knock on the shelves with my knuckles to see whether they sound sound. Um, if you can, and I've done this occasionally, is that if you can open the control panel on the kiln and look at the wiring, that's a good thing to do, to see whether there's evidence of whether, whether there have been any shorts where, or any arcing or discoloring or melting or anything going on. If you can actually, nowadays a lot of the, the, newer, the newer controls are nice, they're actually hinged, so you undo a set of screws and the whole panel just kind of opens sideways like a door. And some of the older ones, you had to take out a complete set of screws and pull the cover off. If you can do that while you're contemplating the sale, it's really a good idea to look at just what kind of, because then you see, the, you see the contacts, the connections between the elements and the, and the switches and so forth. And just look for obvious things like, you know, are there any evidence of burning or charring or, or anything like that? Just look and see what kind of condition the wires are in. Um, in terms, okay, and then in terms of good, so these, those are things that I consider fair, you know, fairly important to look at. Um, as far as good features that, you know, not necessarily critical, but they're nice to have, or at least I want to find out what kind of condition they are in. For instance, does the kiln have, if it has, if it has an electronic controller, does it have protection tubes over the thermocouples, or are they bare thermocouples? And so if you look at, if you look inside the kiln, a bare thermocouple, you'll see the two wires of the thermocouple. Thermocouple is basically just a pair of wires connected at the end. So if this is the kiln wall, there might be a little, a little tube, ceramic tube coming in, and then you might see something that looks kind of like that. That's the actual end, that's the metal thermocouple. And so is, do you see that, or do you just see something that looks sort of like a little ceramic test tube, that's the protection tube, in which case the thermocouple is inside that, and it's protected. And that's this, if you can get one, if you have one with a protection tube, that's nice because the, the thermocouple will last longer. The corrosive fumes that are produced during bisque, especially bisque firing, and to some extent glaze firing, actually corrode and, and after all, they'll eat the thermocouple. So, um, and thermocouples have a limited life, just like elements, but the protection code will extend the life of the thermocouple. So it's not critical, but it's a nice feature if they have protection tubes over the, over the thermocouples. Um, I, look at the, I look at the thickness of the kiln walls. Not all the, the brick walls on, on all models are the same. And in, in, as, as kilns were developed, they started advertising you could get kilns. You know, that was one of the features that, that manufacturers were promoting was that they had better insulation. So look at the thickness of the walls on the kiln because the, you know, that's gonna save you electricity, but also it's gonna affect your firings. The kiln will cool down more slowly with thicker walls and you might actually find you, you like the results you get on your glazes better than if the, kilns, than if the, the kiln cools down really quickly. So instead of, uh, and the typical range I've seen is like anywhere between, on thickness is two and a half to three inches. But, but look, again, look for the thickness of the, of the, of the, the insulation on the walls. Um, I look at the body of the kiln. Is it a segmented body or is it a single piece body? 
That doesn't make a whole lot of difference from what I've seen as far as insulation, but it does as far if you want to move the kiln. You know, the, 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 rings, the kilns come in segments now or, or sections. And so if you're going to be transporting it and you think you won't want to move it, it's a whole lot easier to move a segmented kiln because um, usually what happens is the, the, the top ring will come off with, the, with the, the lid or you can even separate the lid and then you have th at least three sections and then a bottom and a stand. It's a whole lot easier to move if you don't have to pick it up all in one piece. I had a Crusader that was originally a unibody, one piece, and it was a nice kiln, but it was the, the one disadvantage it was a pain to move because it was heavy. So I look at the, I look at the, you know, that's just, it's a nice feature. If they're segmented, it's a whole lot easier to transport. Um, another thing I look at is on the top of the, the plate, you know, you've seen all these electric kilns. They usually have sort of a fairly, th uh, like a square metal frame that a, a stand that the kiln sits on and they have legs like that. And most of the ones just are just a sort of an angle iron frame like that. But some of the kilns have a solid metal plate on the top of the, the stand. Look, that's a nice feature because you get much more a stronger support of the bottom of the kiln if this is a solid plate rather than just this angle iron framework. So it's worth looking at the kiln stand. You know, get down on your hands and knees or on the floor and look at it under if they can't tell you and see whether you have that solid plate. There are, when they make these plates, in some cases now, they're making them with a hole in the center to accommodate these, these exhaust fans. On the older ones, they didn't, but it's, easy to, it's really easy to drill the holes in the bottom if you have to. But this solid plate is a really nice feature. And originally, Pete, you paid extra for it when you, when you bought the kiln, but it gives you much more support for the bricks on the bottom of the kiln. Another, another feature I look for is, is, is there a counterbalance on the lid? Is there some kind of counterbalance mechanism to help so that you're not lifting the full weight of the lid? On some of these large kilns, like these large oval kilns that are like four or five feet long or something and three feet across, the lid is really heavy. Um, and, depend, and also depending on you know, how, how, what your stature is like, if, you're, if you tend to be short and this thing has to go way up in the air, it's, a, it's really hard by yourself to lift the lid. So more and more now, kiln, uh, kiln companies are adding some kind of a counterbalance, either a spring or some kind of a mechanism to help take the weight off it so that you really you can swing it more easily. So look at just, again, it's, a, it's not critical, but it's a nice feature if there's some kind of a counterbalance. And I also look at once the lid is up, what supports the lid in the up position? Like, again, on the kilns we have here, for instance, they have a combination of a spring and a frame that holds the kiln sort of in the open position. In the old days, in previous kilns, they'd have maybe a chain or they had some kind of an, a single arm, like a prop that held it up. But again, look and see what it's got to hold the, to hold the kiln in the upright position. Because I had a friend who had a kiln and the, the prop was insecure. And what happens was one time when he put it up there, the prop broke and the lid slammed down and just shattered the whole lid. And he just, you know, he never thought about it, but when he, when he put it up, the prop just let go, the screws or something let go of it, and the whole lid just, just fell down back on the kiln and just brought the kiln, just, the lid just smashed. So make sure that there's something to hold the lid up securely. Um, and, what, and what condition it is, it, is it in? One of the things that on older kilns you'll find, the screw, the hinge, that the, that the lid is mounted on, the screws that go into the body get loose. So is what the hinge that, that and, and a lot of, on the older kilns, that's the only thing that's holding, that's the only thing that's holding up the whole lid is that hinge. There, you know, there isn't maybe a very su strong support mechanism. So look at the screws holding the hinge on the kiln. Are they, is it sturdy enough so that the lid is gonna, you know, it, the lid will, will not fall off, okay? The other, another thing I look for, is on a manual kiln where I've got switches and I don't have an electronic controller, I look at the type of switches. Are they infinite? What are called, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Are they called infinite switches? Which means that when you look at the face of the switch, it'll say like off, and then typically on L and L they had like low, and then they had numbers like two, th two, four, six, eight, ten high, but that's an infinite switch. Which what that means is that you can put it any, you have all that, a full range of settings like you do on an electric stove. But before that, um, typically what they had, they had switches that were low, medium, and high. And before that, all they had the switches that were on or off. So you have a lot more control with, with the low, medium, high than you did with the on or off. And you have a lot even more control if you have the in, what are called infinite switches than if you just have the low, medium, high. Because then you can control the settings more precisely. On, some of the, the, on a lot of the, the first kilns that were produced, 
All you had the choice of was you turn the elements on or not. And when they came on, they just came on and they heated up at whatever rate they heated up at. There was, that, was, that was the extent of control. And there's still, you know, there's still kilns out there that are like that. And the kiln might be in great shape, but, but look at the type of switches, because that's going to tell you how much control you're going to have over, over your firings. Um, does the, another, another thing to ask is, does the kiln come with a vent fan? And this, by, that, by the vent fan, I'm talking about the kind where the, the, you actually have a, a, a tube or a pipe that connects to the bottom of the kiln. And the idea is that you have a fan which is drawing air down through the kiln. You have holes in the top of the kiln, a couple of small holes, a couple of holes in the bottom. And the idea of the fan is to, is to it doesn't create a wind tunnel effect. It just pulls a small amount of air through the kiln so that any fumes that are generated are pulled out of the kiln. So they're not, they're not sitting in the kiln to attack the bricks and all the metal and all the color corrosion. They're gotten out of the kiln. And at the same time, then they're, got, they're, they're removed from the room because then the hose from the kiln vent is usually can, is put out a window or through a hole in the wall. And so see if it, that's a big, and the kiln vent I think is a really significant improvement over the kilns because it extends the life of the elements. It extends the life of, the, of, the, of all the metal components. Um, but it, and even the bricks, people may not be aware of this, but the fumes that come off from a kiln when you fire it, especially the bisque firing, actually attack the bricks of the kiln. They eat the bricks. Um, and a matter of fact, along with those lines is when you look at a kiln and you open the lid, look at the top surface of the bricks, right on the top of the kiln, but not on the inside. Look on the outside between where the brick meets the metal shell, because that's actually where the fumes attack the it, it's strange, but it, it attacks it from the outside in because when the fumes come out of the kiln and they meet the air outside the kiln, it forms sulfuric acid and it actually attacks the bricks. And I've seen old, we have some, we had bricks at a studio where I worked and the outside quarter to three eighths of an inch was all crumbly and basically turned to powder. So look right behind the metal on the top. That will tell you again how carefully the person was inventing the kiln. Okay, so. Particular features that I look for for a front-loading kiln. Now, if, I'm, if I've got a kiln, if I'm looking at a kiln, this has a door on the front rather than a top, rather than the top loader. Um, obvious thing is, does the door close snugly and cleanly? One of the problems with older, with older kilns is that the hinges get loose, the screws get loose, and the door sags, and the door hits so that it doesn't close cleanly and smoothly when you open it and close it. Um, and a really, to me, the most important thing is, are there elements in the door? Personally, again, this is a matter of personal preference, but I wouldn't buy a, a front-loading kiln that doesn't have elements in the door. Because in spite of what the manufacturers will tell you, there is a cold zone in the inside. If you're, if you're only heating it from three sides, then the, 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 side, the side of the load facing the door is going to be colder than, than, the, than, the, than the other sides. And I did, we, we, at one of the places where I was teaching, we, got, we, 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 we bought um, a couple of front-loading kilns and I did some testing on it. And when you look down at the, it was a square body. And so this was the door. When you look, but there were only elements on the, on the back and the two sides. And I did testing and I did mapping with cones to look at the temperature. And there was a zone that looked roughly like that, that was colder than the whole rest of the kiln, all the way up the front, which makes sense because it, there weren't any elements in the front. And, and extending the length, for, at least from my experience, extending the length of the firing didn't make up for it. Because by the time I extended the length or changed the heating rate to get this to heat up, then other parts were overfired. So again, that's something to me that's, and I don't know, I, I, I just don't understand why they're still selling kilns that don't have elements in the door. How big was the difference? Uh, two cones. Wow. <laughs> that's significant. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. And depending on how, and, I, and I, when I was testing it, I was doing very open loading because I just didn't have a lot of pots. If you had a lot of pots in there, it might have even been more. And this, the kiln, the, the, the dimensions were about, it was about two feet square, roughly, inside. This was about two feet on a side. So um, the other thing is, in relation to the door is a lot of the older kilns have a gasket around the door. It's like it's made out of ceramic fiber. Look and see whether they get, if, it, if you see a groove around the door, if it isn't just like tapered bricks, then there should, if there's a groove running in the bricks, there should be a gasket in there. Is there so is there still a gasket in there? Because when, they, when the kilns were designed to have a gasket, that was an important part of sealing the door. A lot of the newer ones now, or some of the newer ones now, don't have a gasket in them. Um, but if it had a gasket, you needed the gasket in order, to, in order to get a good seal. You can buy replacement gasket material. That's not an issue. But just look and see if you have it. 
Um, another thing I look for in the, in the front-loading kilns is where it, does it have a peephole and where are the peepholes located? Because the nice thing about like the, 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 the top loaders is, especially if they have three zones, they'll have a, they'll have a peephole in each, in each of the zones. And the peepholes are really handy. And the, 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 one of the issues I found with some of the, the, top, the front loaders that I've seen is they'd have one peephole and it wasn't in a particularly convenient location. And all I had, so I had a fairly large chamber, but only one peephole. And as you're probably all aware, and this is one of my, my favorite points is, you should be firing by looking at cones, not, not depending on the electronic controller or not depending on the, on, the, on the kiln sitter, definitely. So you need peepholes to be able to monitor the firing. So anyway, I mentioned, so these are, so, I, so location of the peepholes is important. Now, if you, if you get a, a front loader, you can, you could drill holes in the shell. All, all the, they usually, the front loaders, by the way, also usually have a sturdier um, frame because because it has to, you know, it's, it's support, because it has to support the door. The whole, the whole point of the frame on a front loader is you've got to have a much sturdier box because now you're hanging the door, the weight of the door off the box. Um, but you can, but it is possible to add additional peep holes in a, in a front loader by just drilling holes through the metal shell and drilling holes through the brick. But one of the things, another issue is, and I've, I haven't seen much discussion of it, is can you adopt a kiln fan to a front loader? Most of the, the front loading kilns with the door that I've seen You'd have to drill holes in the bottom and put holes in the top, or you'd have to figure out some way to adapt it. They're not, they don't, a lot of the ones I've seen, they don't come supplied with that. Like if you buy, most of the cases now, if you buy a commercial top loading kiln, you can order it or get it with a fan. And it's just, it comes with, they've, they've put in the holes, they've, you know, and it's, so that's just something to think about is that, are you, can you, can you install, will you be able to install or will you want to install a kiln fan on it? Because that'll be extra work that you'll probably have to do on a front loader. Yeah, I would. I don't. I don't. I mean, they're they're good. We've we've used them over at Hood for sculpture, because you know it's a, you end up with one nice big chamber, and they're easy to load sideways. That's the big advantage of them. You're loading them sideways, and on and on, and of course on a lot of analogous to a lot of production studios, in some cases you don't have to take the shelves out. I've known I've known potters, production potters that had front loaders, and they were always making the same work, so they never took the shelves out of the kiln. They just unload the shelves. Because they always fired the set, so they always knew that the top two shelves were going to be mugs, and the middle shelf was going to be medium bowls, and the large was going to be bottom bowl. So they just they just swapped the work out. So and and especially for things like sculpture or fragile work, it is nice to be able to just put them in sideways. We hope you're enjoying the show. Please take a moment to leave a five star review on your podcast platform of choice. It really helps new listeners find the show. Don't forget to subscribe to receive updates as new episodes are released. Now let's get back to the show. Okay, so now for, so that was for like features that I look at for a front loading kiln. When I look at a kiln that has, has manual controls, as I said, and I've touched on this already, this is an older kiln with, just with manual controls, not a, not a programmable or electronic. Again, I look at the kind of switches. Are they infinite switches? Are they low, medium, high, or are they on off? Um, I, I probably, personally, I wouldn't buy a kiln that, has, that still has on off switches. Low, medium, high is okay, but the older kilns that are on off, you just, to me, I don't, if, if I have, it's not worth it. I don't have the control. Um, I look at the number of zones that I have control, like how many zones are there? Are there, are there three in a normal size, let's say a seven cubic foot kiln, are there three zones so that I have, I have three sets of controllers that I can control independently? The more zones, the better. Because then I can, I can, if I have to compensate for a hot, a hot t bottom or a cold bottom or something like that, or, or, or just to, even depending on when I'm loading the kiln, I, can, I, I have more, more variability in my firing. Um, and I also look at the condition of the kiln sitter, and I guess I'll, I'll, I'll put in my standard message here is the fact that kiln sitters were never designed to be kiln controllers. They were only, although everybody uses them as a controller, they were only meant to be a safety device so that if you were running your kiln and you had to step outside for a while and you got run over by a bus, the kiln wouldn't overfire and burn your house down. But they were never designed to be a controller, so you should still be firing by cones. But, but if you have a kiln sitter on the kiln, Look at the condition of the kiln sitter. Look at the, the for instance, on the inside of the kiln sitter, there's a, there's a ceramic rod that supports the cones. And so look at the condition. 
this, there's a rod that comes through the wall of the thing, and it, and it typically has, it has two metal blades that stick out like that. And then it has a rod, and the rod moves in a slot. So look at the condition. So if you looked at it sideways, there'd be a metal blade, and then there'd be this rod, and there's two of these blades. Look at the condition of them. Are they all corroded? Are they intact? And also, take your finger and wiggle the rod. That rod, this rod, when you put the, you set the cone in here, like that, and the, 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 the cone sits across the two blades, and then the rod comes down and rests on the top of it. And the way the, the, way the kiln sitter functions is when the cone droops, the rod drops, basically. The rod comes down and drops a little bit because it's resting on the cone. And then on the other end, the end goes up and it shuts off the switch. So take your finger and wiggle that rod up and down. Does the rod move freely up and down? I, we had a kiln at one of the studios where I worked where and it was in a shed outside. It was completely protected from the weather, but it was outside. And I went and we had a problem with the kiln and I went to move the rod with my finger and it wouldn't move at all because a mud dauper wasp had gotten in the hole and built a nest. <laughs> so there was, and, and it, was, it was one of the kind that lays like one egg or something. And so I, I, I took the whole thing apart and cleaned it out and there was a mud dauper's wasp nest. Because we had, you know, puddled there, so there, anyway, it was a nice little spot for a nest. So the, the rod was completely frozen, so it would, never would have shut off. So that also, and, and, and can, corrosion can also impede that. So take your finger and just flip it up and down. Make sure, it, make sure it's free. Also, look at the condition, look at the condition of the ceramic tube that's sticking through the wall. Is it cracked or is it corroded? Is it, is it, in, is it in good shape? Um, on the other end, if I look at, if I, if I diagram just the, the kiln sitter, Let's say here's the wall of the kiln. And this is sort of this is the control box for the kiln sitter sitting on the outside. And then the, the, the ceramic tube sits, comes through like this, and there's the rod. On the outside of the kiln, this rod continues all the way through, and this and this is where your switch is out here. Is that look at the controls out here and make sure that the switch works. You can push the like what happens is that this. This is, this is connected to a trigger, and when, the tri when this drops, there's a switch, there's a button that pushes the switch. Make sure that that button, that the on-off button switches, because if this, I've, and I've had, I've had where the, the, all the rest of the mechanism works fine. The, the, the arm works, the, the weight drops, but the, the button is stuck, mm -hmm. so it would never shut off the switch. So make sure the button is, the, the on-off button on the kiln sitter is, is functioning properly. Okay, and electronic controls. Well, the problem is you can't really assess the electronics directly. So one of the things I look for on electronic, at least I look for corrosion. Again, has the kiln been, if the kiln's been used a lot, is there a lot of just evidence of corrosion all over anywhere on the kiln? Because to me that says that you can't totally keep the corrosion out from contacts and things like that. So I just look, I look for corrosion. You know, is, it, is, it, is, is, is everything corroded and therefore I look at it and go, well, you know, that might have a problem if this kiln is, is really heavily corroded. And I look at other features on the electronic controls, like are the thermocouples intact? Because the electronic controller is, is totally dependent on the thermocouple to read the temperature and to work. So if the thermocouples are in bad shape, um, then the, the controller is useless. The controller might be in great shape, but the, thermocouple, the controller is useless without functioning thermocouples. Another thing to look at is even is how many thermocouples there are. Are there? There are kilns, and this is, this is an option in, in models. Some kilns only have one thermocouple connected to a controller. Others might have three. They have three zones, and they have a thermocouple in each zone. You pay extra for that feature when you buy the kiln because each, each zone then can be controlled separately. And if you think about it, if you only have one thermocouple in a kiln, then the whole uniformity of the firing is dependent on that one spot where the temperature is being measured. That's how that's, that's basically functioning. That one, that, the location of the thermocouple in that one place is measuring the temperature, and that's telling the program, the, the controller, what to do. Well, that one spot in the kiln may or may not be representative of the temperature everywhere. So in that respect, I think, you know, if you have three thermocouples, that's better than one, because it's sampling the temperature in the different places. And then I look at other features, for instance, if you look at the, at the at when they have, usually electronic controllers have two types of programs. You can do what they call cone fire, where you basically just select the cone, you say fire to cone five, or they have ramp and hold, where you can write your own programs. 
So one of the things I look at is, when I look at cone fire, how many speeds do they give you? Some kilns only give you two speeds, some kilns give you three. So typically for the cone fire, you, you just say like cone five, medium speed, and you push the button and that's, that's the programming. But how many speeds do they give you? I've seen anywhere from two to three, and three is better. You know, like low, medium, high speed, rather than, or fast and slow, rather than, rather than just two. And then I also look, and this is where you may need the, you probably need the manual, but if you're going to write your own custom program for the kiln, you write it in terms of segments, like different portions of the kiln. And a segment consists of how fast you're going to heat up, what temperature you're going to go to, and how long you're going to hold at that temperature. That's a segment. And so you write a program that you'd say, I'm going to heat up a certain amount, go to this temperature and hold. Now I'm going to heat up again to another temperature and hold or not. And you keep each one of those as a segment. Different kilns vary on the number of segments they allow you to write a program. So look in the manual, and if, you're gonna, if you think you might want to write some really creative or, or, or you know, extensive programs, look in the manual and find out how many segments will they allow you to write. And I say, I don't, most people I know don't know off the top of their head, so you'd have to check the manual. But how many segments in the ramp and hold program? How many, how many segments can you write, six or eight or how many? And that will determine you know, how complicated or how involved a program you can write. Some kilns will allow you to combine two programs. They'll, allow you to, they'll, for instance, allow you to take one program and piggyback another one on top of it. That's, another, that's a nice feature if it has that. And, de and, just, and most of the kilns, from what I've seen today, have features like a delay where you can, um, and that, that's fairly common, but again, look and see if it has it, where you can, you can write the program, <clears throat> excuse me, and then you can have the kiln actually wait a certain amount of time before it actually kicks on. That's a really nice feature I found because then you can, you can have the kiln accommodate your schedule rather than the other way around. So that when I'm, when I'm firing the kilns here at the studio, I am always here when the kiln shuts off. And I, I will never fire a kiln where I'm not present when it shuts off, partially because I want to look at the cones, I want to see how the kiln, I and mean, I want to make sure that it, that it is in fact going to shut off. Because even with electronic controllers, it doesn't matter. Things can happen where they can, they can fail to shut off. I have a great example at home of a stack of melted shelves from a kiln that went, it was supposed to be, I think, I think it was supposed to be a cone 10 firing. I don't know what it went to, but cone 10 clay melted. And the kiln completely destroyed itself. It didn't start a fire, it shut down, and the, the elements arced. But it was an electronic controller and it failed to shut off. So just as a matter of safety, I'm, I'm always here. Well, and that's not so hard to do because I can, I, can, I can load the kiln, set the program, and then put a delay on it and count backwards so that I can say, okay, I'm going to be here at 10 o'clock tomorrow. Well, I'll plan it so that the firing finishes off at 10 o'clock when I get here. So that's a really nice feature to have. Okay, let's move. I'm going to talk a little bit about gas kilns. I don't know how many of you might be interested in buying used gas kilns, but there are two, there are two kinds that basically, and I bought both kinds in, in past what I'm calling studio kilns, which were originally designed for indoor use, and that is they, they usually have a metal frame, and they're basically commercial products. So they might be like Bailey or Guile or Laguna. This is a, it's basically a, a commercial, a box with a metal frame. Um, they might be either brick-lined or they might be ceramic fiber-lined, um, but they're basically, they were originally designed for indoor use or at least use in a protected, in a protected space. Also, you might have opportunity to buy Basically, a homemade kiln or a home, an owner-built kiln, which is basically stacked bricks. You know, there is, there is no, they, they, may, they, you know, may have, they might have designed it themselves. Um, and the, the problem with that, with those kind of kilns are, it's hard to assess when you're, how well the kiln worked. I've seen a lot of kilns that, were, that, were, that people built that were not designed well and they, and they didn't fire well. And they'd have them for a number of years, and they, they, you know, they might use them for 20 years, but then they ended up selling them. Well, they never fired well to begin with. And so really, when you're buy, if you're buying an owner-built kiln, um, you're, you're really just buying the materials because there's no guarantee about it. And you're going to have to rebuild the kiln. It's, if it's stacked bricks, typically, and I've, I've bought kilns like this, you, you take the kiln apart, you take the bricks, you move the bricks to your site, and then you rebuild the kiln, and you, and you have to reset up the burner system yourself. So there are a lot of questions involved. So what I found is... To, to buy that kind of a kiln or those materials, you need to know a lot more. You need to know, for instance, what kind of burners they are and to assess where those, are those burners the, the right size for that kiln. 
Not to mention, you know, whether you're going to build the same design or design your own. But it's very hard to it's very hard to determine how well that kiln works. So you're really just buying a bunch of bricks and some burners and a little bit of plumbing, and then it's up to you to decide what kind of a kiln can I build that's appropriate for those burners and so forth. Okay, so, it, but the feature is basically, when I, when I look at the kind of kiln, whether it's a commercial or whether it's a, a homemade, an owner-made one, I look at the kind of kiln, is it an updraft, meaning that the, 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 typically the, the flame comes in at the bottom and it exhausts at the top, is it a downdraft, where, the, 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 where, the, where the, the flame exits the, the chamber at the bottom, in which case you need a chimney? So, one of the, so the, the big thing is, look at the type of kiln and think about how does that work with, with your intended site? Where do you plan to put the kiln, and will this kiln work in that site? For instance, a, a simple thing like, the, is electrical power needed for the kiln? Are you going to put it in a shed out in your backyard somewhere that you just, you know, you were going to build maybe a roof over it. So did it re does, it have, does it have fans or some feature of it that's going to require electrical power or not? It's going to run totally without an outside power source. Is it going to need a chimney or not? So that, that's, it's really in relation to not so much that one is better or worse than another, but, but is it suitable for where you're planning on putting the kiln? Um, as I mentioned, is it fire brick lined or is it fiber lined? Um, one of the thing, this is one of the things I'm looking at, and, and, and related to that is, can it be moved? Even if it's a commercial kiln, if it's fire brick lined, you're going to need somebody to move it for you. You're going to need a, move, a rigger or somebody to move it. Usually most of the ones, they're, they're, they're too heavy, and they need to be moved carefully. You, you, you crunch and you break a lot of the bricks. And then I look, at, I look at features like the overall condition. And the big one, again, is rust. Are the, are, are the burners, is the, is the metal frame all rusted and corroded? Are the burners you know, heavily rusted? What, what kind of shape are they in? I look at the lining. Is the lining intact? If they're bricks, are the bricks cracked? Are they in good shape? Or are there a lot of their cracked or broken bricks? Are they glazed, meaning that there's, a, there's a, a, like a melted coating on the surface? But is there ever? I've seen I've seen cases, for instance, where people built they built a kiln and they used the wrong type of bricks, and so the bricks were basically overfired, and you could see that the bricks had shrunk, and so all the bricks had shrunk and cracked and sort of pulled away. So the insulation there were a lot there were big cracks between the bricks because the because the bricks had eventually been overfired. So those bricks basically were worthless. I couldn't use them. So I look, if it's fiber lined, look at the condition of the fiber blanket. Is it torn? And especially, is it brittle? Because fiber blanket, after it's used for a very short period of time, gets brittle. When you first install new blanket, it's flexible and soft, almost cottony like. But after, after not too long a while, the fibers get very brittle. And just touching them, they break and fall apart. So it's great. Fiber lining is great if you don't touch it and you don't bump it. And you don't, you know, you're not moving it besides, you know, the, the obvious thing about you don't want to be breathing the, the, the broken fibers. But it also is easy to damage if it, once it gets really brittle. So look at the, look at the blanket, if it's a blanket line kiln, and just, just touch it and see what, and it's like, it sort of reminds me of like touching the surface of like a brownie or something, where you can, you can, you just put a little press and it sort of crunches through, there's like a crust on it. And see if it's brittle or see if it still has some flexibility to it. Um, again, if it's a if it's a um, if it's a studio kiln, then it's it's probably in mo in a lot of ca not all cases, but in most cases, it's going to be a front loader. We have a we have a top loader here, but um, does the door close well? Do you get a good seal on the door? Another thing to make sure when you're looking at the kiln is to find out were the burners designed for propane or natural gas, because if the burners are designed for propane. Um, then that's one thing, but if they're designed for, net, and, and the, the point is here is you're going to require obviously a different source, gas source, and um, if you and if it's, if it's for, if it, and you can tell, one of the ways you can tell by looking at the kiln is that natural gas, if you see the previous setup, uses very large piping, and it'll be connected to a utility. Nobody has their own natural gas supply that I'm aware of in, in normal circumstances. So you'd be connected to a utility, Whereas the propane is going to use smaller sized tubing and it's just going to be connected to a tank. So again, is where do you plan to use it and how do you plan to supply it? Okay. If, you're going to, if you're going to be actually hooking it up to natural gas, 
Then you, something else to consider is you're going to need permits and you're going to need town or city inspections. So there's a lot more, there's a lot more of an involved process hooking up a kiln to natural gas because natural gas is a utility. And so you have to get inspections and you have to get approvals to permits to connect an appliance, basically, to the, nat to the, to the utility. With propane, you don't. With propane, you can usually just work with the propane company in terms of doing the plumbing and setting it up. Now, you can convert, you can convert burners from propane to natural gas or natural gas to propane by changing the, the size of the, the opening, the orifice in it, but um, it, it requires a little bit of work, so that's something to think about. Um, when I look, at, when I look at, a, at a gas furnace, I look at some of the features of the, I want to see how, how, how nicely they've, they've set up the gas, the, the features on the kiln. So one of the things to look at, for instance, is do the burners have pilot burners? And a pilot burner is basically, it's a pilot, it's a safety device. And the idea is it's, a, it's an extra burner that, is in, that will relight the main burner in case the main burner goes out. If you're firing, especially if you're firing outside, it's possible for a gust of wind or something to actually blow out the, to blow out the flame, and then you're just pumping raw gas into your kiln, which is not very safe. So, yeah. So typically, on 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 a lot of these burn, like this this like this might be a a, a a typical burner, and there'll be another burner, another little burner that will, will point, for instance, here, at the. This is another little burner with a little separate gas line. And this is a pilot burner. And the idea is that if this burner goes out, the pilot stays on and it immediately relights the main burner. It's a safety device. So it's just good to know, like, does this, does this again, depending on you know, what your requirements are, what you feel your needs are, um, does this come with a, with a pilot burner or not? Um, does it come with a basso valve? And the basso valve is a, is a safety valve that's connected to the pilot light or to a thermocouple. And again, it's a safety device that if the temperature drops, if there's a little temperature probe here, if the temperature drops, the basso valve shuts off the gas to the main burner so that there's no possibility that you can just keep pumping gas into the kiln. So does, is it set up for a basso valve? Because you, you, can, you can have a gas burner with no basso valve. You just have a hose, and you have a burner on the end, and you light it, and you've got flame. But if the flame goes out, now you're just pumping gas into the kiln. So with, either the, with or without the, the pilot burner or with a basso valve, you have this safety, safety feature that if the, if the flame goes out, the temperature drops, it shuts off the gas. So does it have it? Because if, if you want it, um, I, I fired kilns with them and I fired kilns without them. Most of my kilns that I've built, I don't have them. I don't have the, actually, I don't have basso or safety valves on them because I never leave the kiln when I'm firing my gas kilns. I never leave it. So I'm always there. And if it, if it, if it goes out, I'm always there to relight it instantly. It's not going to be pumping gas in. But you want to find out. Does it have a secondary regulator? Usually on, on gas systems, this is propane now, there'll be a, there'll be a propane tank There'll be a regulator on the top of the tank to control the pressure of the gas coming from the tank. And then there'll be a line that goes to the, to the burner. And before it actually gets to the burner, there'll be another regulator to reduce the pressure even further. Because you, you can't have your tank very close to your burner. It's a safety hazard. And there, there are actually legal requirements as far as distances you have to maintain. So typically what you'll do is, you don't use the pressure coming right out of the tank because that's much higher than you can use or you want to use. So you reduce it to what's called line pressure. And, you, and then you run the line to the, burn, to, the, to the kiln or to the burner, and then you reduce it even further. So does the system have the, this is This is the primary regulator on the gas tank. This is the secondary regulator. Does it have a secondary regulator? And the reason why you need that is you have much better control. You want to be able to, when you fire a gas kiln, you want to, you want to set it to a certain pressure, and then you open and close a flow valve to, to control the amount of gas that you're getting at that pressure. So you need these regulators in order to get that sensitivity in the control. So does it have it? Um, are there pressure gauges on it? Are there gauges on the regulator that can show you? Because again, for consistency, what you'd like to do is if once you get your kiln set up and you're firing it, you'd like to be able to say, okay, I know that if I run these burners at five PSI, 
that I have, I, the burners work nicely, I have good sensitive control, and I get good results. So every time you fire it, you say, I want to be firing at 5 PSI. Well, when you just open the tank, you don't automatically get 5 PSI. It depends on the weather, depends on the pressure, the level in the tank. So you might have to make adjustments. So you want these regulators and you want these pressure gauges to be able to set the conditions so that they're reproducible. And then your results will be more reproducible. Okay, pottery wheels. Looking at, and there are, there are a bunch of different, there are like three different main kinds that I'm thinking of in terms of pottery wheels. Kick wheels, which basically have a flywheel. And the flywheels typically may be either concrete, or they may be a metal plate, or they may be what I call a brick sandwich, where you have bricks or some kind of weight between, trapped between either metal plates or, or, or pieces of wood to, to give you the weight. And then there are treadle wheels, where you, you're, you're basically more or less constantly, there's a foot treadle or a pedal, and you're pumping the, the wheel. And then there are, there are motor-assisted kick wheel. These are all manual wheels. So there are, full, there are kick wheels, there are treadle wheels, and then there are motor-assisted kick wheels. We'll have a motor with a little, typically a rubber wheel that you can bring in contact with the flywheel and, and, and provide sort of additional, like, crude form of like motor-driven motor, motor -driven kick wheel. Um, these are the manual wheels. So talking about, anyway, manual pottery wheels, one thing to look at, and I've, I've bought, I bought, when I set up my pottery school in Maine years ago, I didn't have enough money to buy, I couldn't begin to buy new equipment. So I was scouting around for months looking for scavenge, all kinds of used pottery wheels. So I bought, I ended up buying about 12 different kinds of, of pottery wheels, all manual. But first of all, like, is, the, is the flywheel, does, is, it, is it free spinning? Does it, does, it, does, it, does it wobble? Does it have any friction noise? Are there any sounds of vibration? Or does it just, you know, are the bearings good so that it just turns and turns and turns, which is what you want? Um, does it, what's the weight of the flywheel? Heavier, except for moving it, heavy is better. Because if you're doing a straight kick wheel, where you're going to be kicking, you're not kicking constantly. You kick it, and then you can take. You know, you can stop kicking and work on the wheel. The, the heavier the wheel is, the longer it's going to it's going to turn by itself. The less you'll have to kick it. So heavier is good, in terms of operation. Hard to move, but good for operation. And again, the old thing is, what's the overall condition of the wheel? Is it rusted? Is the if if it has a wooden frame, is the wooden frame sturdy? Um, and also something else to consider is. What's the size and the weight of these? I had a, I had a commercial one a number of years ago, and the, 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 the whole wheel on the frame was like 450 pounds. And so it was a bear to move. And it also, these things are large. And what I found out after I bought it and got it home was it didn't fit through my door. <laughs> <laughs> so, and if I, so I had to, part, I had to take, do a lot of sort of disassembly and take off part of my door. And I had to stand this 450 pound wheel up on its end and I ended up rolling it actually on the wheel. I used, I used the pottery wheel as the wheel, and, I, and with, with two other guys helping me, we rolled it through the door after I removed the door. But some of these things are large, and so can, you know, are you going to be able to move it? It might be the greatest bargain in the world, but can you get it home, and can you get it in your door? And I almost didn't, but it, I couldn't have, you know, it would have sat in my yard um, otherwise. Something else to think about is, because they've been making these, these these manual wheels forever, what's the size of the wheel head? That, and the wheel head is the, is the, the, the flat wheel, you know, the, the platform at the top of the wheel. Because when they first were making these, they were making them a lot smaller. And so, and whereas now I think 14 inches is kind of more standard, but they were making a lot smaller ones. And the problem is also when they were making smaller ones, the bat pins, the bolts for the bat pins were closer together. So they've only recently standardized sort of at about a 10 inch spacing for the, for the pins to hold the bats. Well, that wasn't always true. So if you get one that has the older spacing on the bat pins, you're either gonna have to put new bolts in the, in the wheel head or you're gonna have to redrill all your bats. So that's something to look at. It's, it's, and it's not an impossibility, but it's an inconvenience at least. So look at the size of the wheel head. And especially if you like to throw larger pieces, some of the old wheel heads were really small and they're not very stable for putting a large bat on. They just don't provide much support. So look at the size of the wheel head. And then just something else to think about. Is there, is there, is there a usable workspace or tray around the wheel head? Is there some place there that where you can put tools on or other supplies or, or, or finished work as you're working on the piece that you can put it down, that you've got a, a workspace there, a work area around the wheel head? And lastly, is the, is the seat adjustable, the seat, and is it comfortable? 
Um, I had some I had that were made. I had some wheels that were made from kits, and the seat wasn't adjustable. So it wasn't adjustable, and it wasn't comfortable. Um, and so you know, so I, I didn't tell people ahead of time which seat they were getting. I just said, you know, pick a wheel that you want to use, and that's what we'll do. But um, but but look at just you know look at the seat because a lot of these, especially the wooden frame ones, there wasn't any cushion on or anything. It's just wood, and so you're sitting on a board. So is it is it a comfortable seat? Is it a comfortable for you um, to be able to use it? For electric wheels, um, and I'm going to include actually the motor-assisted one here. They're either all electric or they're what I was calling motor-assisted kick wheels. For the motor-assisted wheels, basically, it really a lot of them were, were literally a motor, and on the end of the shaft of the motor there was a small rubber wheel, and it was positioned so that you could move the motor and and move it so that that rubber wheel contacted the top of the of the the flywheel, and it would and it would propel the flywheel. And literally, just, there'd, just, there'd just be a motor, and the motor might be mounted on some kind of a movable arm, and there'd be a shaft, and there'd be a rubber wheel, and the rubber wheel would draw, would sit on and hit the fly, and hit this, the, the, this is the main, the main uh, flywheel. It would just sit and, at the edge, and it would just help propel the, the flywheel. So if you have one of those, is that do you get good track? And there's nothing wrong with it, but do you get good traction? Is it set up so that when you, when you drop the, the, the rubber wheel onto the flywheel, you get good enough traction to actually drive it? Let's, let's talk a little bit about all electric wheels, which are probably mostly what you're going to see. And again, what I look for is what's the overall condition? And one, one thing to check is, is find out, and usually it's on a, there's, there'll be a little identification tag on the, on the wheel itself, is what's the horsepower of the, um, of the of the wheel, the, the 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 lowest sort of common horsepower I think is quarter horse. Dennis, did you say you had a tabletop model? Do you know what the horsepower was on that one? I have no idea. Okay, yeah. I think quarter for like the floor. I think it's a quarter as quarter. well. Yeah. I think quarter horsepower is probably the lowest, and then they go all the way up to a horsepower or more. And and as as Rob, one of the fellows just mentioned that was here, for for if you're throwing mostly small material small items. Um, and you know, you're not throwing 50 pounds of clay, there's nothing wrong with a quarter horsepower. The horsepower just gives you sort of the torque so that if you're, if you're throwing a huge amount of clay with a lot of weight and you're grabbing the clay, you need more horsepower to turn it because of all the friction and the grip you're putting on it. But for most cases, for a lot of people, a quarter horse is perfectly adequate to show you know, small, medium-sized pieces. It's, it's fine. But just it's, it's, it's one thing to look at is what's the horsepower of the wheel you're buying. Another thing is to find out is, when you're looking at it, is what's the, what's the drive mechanism? How is the wheel actually being driven? Um, in some cases, there, there, there are different drive mechanisms that connect the motor to the wheel. It could be a belt. There could be just a, like a, like a, just a rubber belt that connects from the motor via pulleys to the wheel. It could be gear driven. I had, a, I had an Alpine wheel, I mentioned Alpine, that I had for years that was direct gear driven and it was like a tank you, it was impossible to stop, basically, because there was nothing that could slip. It was direct gear drive. But is it gear drive? That's something to look at. Shimpo, older Shimpos had what they used to call a cone drive. I don't know whether they still have that on their newer wheels or not, but the old Shimpo that was called RK1 model had a system where it had a, it had a metal disc and it had a rubber cone that came in and rubbed on the metal disc. And the and you could you could you change the speed by by changing the position where the rubber cone rubbed on the metal disc. It was called cone drive, so it was friction drive. Um, and and there and some of the newer ones now are what are called AC or alternating current induction motors. And so there is there is, there are no belt. That's a, that's what we have here. As a matter of fact, all the ones we have in the studio are AC and induction. And one of the ways you can tell partially what the drive mechanism is is. is can you turn, if you grab just the wheel head with the wheel turned off, can you turn the wheel head? If it's gear driven, you can't. It's just like one mine, I couldn't move it at all. If it's belt, or, or you could turn it slowly, but you were, you were basically turning the motor in reverse. You were using the wheel head to turn the motor. And if it's AC induction, it's completely free spinning because there is no belt. It's basically just the electrical field that's turning the, that's turning the wheel. But it's a good idea to know, find out what it is, and a lot of times you can tell, just turn the, turn the, lay the wheel on its side and look underneath and see what you've got. Do you have a belt, or do you have a gear train, or do you have this, 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 this cone drive from the Shimpo? 
when you're buying a used electric, is, 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 there, is there motor noise or what kind of noise is there you know, when, 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 you're, when you turn it on? But if you can, for instance, is look at the condition. If you can, when you look at the wheel, if you can, turn it over and look at the condition of whatever the drive mechanism is. If it's a belt, what's the condition of the belt? It'll be like a belt. Usually they're, they're, they're like, a lot of the newer belts have like grooves in them and they look almost like the same kind of belt that you have on your car, like a smaller version of the serpentine belt on your car. But look and see, is the belt frayed or is it gla what they call glazed, which means that it's been slipping and the surface of the belt has gotten sort of shiny looking. And usually that, that happens, the same thing happens on cars on your, on your serpentine belt. The, blaze, the, 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 the rubber ages and gets hard and dry and it sort of gets slick looking which, and it also starts, you get cracks in the belt, which means that it's slipping. It means that you probably don't have a lot of belt lifetime left. But look, if you can, look at the condition of the belt. Um, if, you, if you have the rubber cone drive, look at the condition of, the, it, was, it was a rubber cone that was turning against a metal disc. Look at the cone and see whether is it smooth surface or has it gotten chips out of it? Has it got because what's going to happen? It's going to thump and bump, at, or 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 jump a little bit if it has worn spots. So just look at it. Another, one thing to look at also that I think is important on an electric wheel is is there good slow speed control? Is it because especially, I don't know uh, depending on how you throw, but if you especially if you're trimming where you want you don't want the wheel flying around at really high speeds. You want good good steady non-jerky control at slow speed. So try the, try the controller at low speed. Can you get good steady control at low speed? Because you're probably going to, you probably find that the low speed, slow speed is going to be more useful to you in the long term than the really high speed. And also is, can you adjust the speed control? Um, can you adjust it? Like, for instance, like a, a lot of the controllers now come with a foot pedal, and I know I've had, I've had a number of different brands, and I was able to like, take the foot pedal apart and basically make adjustments on it if it started getting out of adjustment. Like, in some cases, I had an old one where when I put the controller all the way supposedly off, the wheel didn't shut off. The wheel kept turning slowly, and that was just a matter of opening the control box open and resetting. There was a little limit screw there that I could just reset. So can you do that? Is it something you think you can get at? And one other feature I look for, as I mentioned to me, it's not critical, but I look for it, is, is the motor reversible? Some, some electric wheels, you can, you can change the direction. It has a little additional switch for direction, which is nice. Um, not essential, maybe, but, but it's nice to have it. So is, that's just a feature to look for. And the and, and I, reason why, when I say all these things, is because to me, this all factors into what I'm willing to pay for the wheel. I, I, even if, you know, if I like the wheel, I might say, well, yeah, it's, you know, it's, if, I'm, if I'm dealing with or work, trying to strike a deal with whoever the seller is, and, I'll look, and, I, and I say, well, it has all these other nice features, then maybe I'll say, okay, I'm willing to pay a little bit more for it. Or if it's in really good condition, maybe I'll pay a little more for it, you know, in terms of just negotiations. So a lot of it isn't necessarily, do I want it or not? Once I decide I want it or I'd like it, it's just, you know, it, it helps me turn, establish the value to me whether it has some of these other features and what the overall condition is like. Okay, so I just want to talk very briefly about the last subject here, although I know a lot of you may not be buying one of these. It would be, would be a clay mixer or a clay, a clay pug mill of some kind, but I just wanted to touch on it. Um, because again, this is something I have bought in the past. And there are, the, the three kinds I, I think about are pug mills, which is basically just a mixer mill for clay, or, or a mill for like extruding the clay out. And then there are mixer mills, a combination of mixer and pug mills now that they make where you don't just put the clay in. I don't know whether you're all familiar with how basically a pug mill works, but it has a barrel. It has a hopper and a barrel. It has a hopper, let's say, and it has a barrel. And in the barrel is a screw. And so you put the clay in the hopper and the motor turns this, this screw and basically forces the clay out the end. The pug mill is, is really, I think the pug mills are good for recycling because basically it's, and, it, and it, the pug mills basically, it's a continuous process. You put clay in and, it, and, and, and you, while you have it running and the clay is coming out the end and you just keep putting clay in. And the way, to, and you can clean the, the pug mill out by just running clay through it. So typically studios where I've been, let's say they want to change clays. They're running one kind of clay through the pug mill. They'll take some scrap clay 
and just or run some clay through of the next batch. And yes, that clay, until it gets all the old clay out, that clay has a combination of both. That's just kind of, you know, but it's like, it's not one of, it's perfect, still usable clay maybe, but it has sort of contaminated. And they'll use like, and that becomes like recycle or scrap clay, and then they start the new batch. So it's, it's, there isn't a whole lot of cleaning involved. It's easy, you just run clay through it. Um, and the other thing is that some of these, the pug mills now, you can get them that, are, that have a vacuum pump on it. So they de-air the clay. So they're vacuum assisted or vacuum. So what it does is on this mixing chamber, it's, you seal the chamber and when you put the clay in, it, the, the, it pumps all the air out so that it helps remove, you don't get the, the air trapped in the clay when it's mixing. Because as you're probably aware, when you fold clay over on itself, you can trap air in it. Well, you don't want air trapped in your clay. So this, when, especially when you're recycling clay, this, by having the vacuum feature, the vacuum pump feature, it pulls all the air out, so you're not introducing and folding air into the clay when you're mixing it. And that's a nice feature. The tub mixers, as I mentioned, they don't have a va they're, used, they're just open, so they don't have any vacuum feature. And the other thing is, they're a batch process. So they are, they are the ones that I've used. They're a pain. They're a lot of work to, to clean because you've got this basin or this, like the, the, um, the, the ones that were sold there, the, the tub was actually made out of concrete. And it was made out of concrete because it had a lot, that way it would have a lot of weight. So the motor would, would drive that and turn and because it took a lot of force to, 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 you know, to, for the, on, the, on the blades to mix the clay because the clay was getting stiff. So that gave extra momentum with the motor to keep this, this tub turning. So you didn't have to have it quite as powerful as a motor to drive it because you had the weight of the tub and the weight of the clay driving it. But the problem is so that when you're finished mixing it, now you've got you've to lift the clay, scoop the clay out of the tub, and then you've got to clean the tub basically manually. So it's, it's a lot more work, whereas the pug mill or the mixing mill, you just push some other clay through and it essentially is self-cleaning, which is a nice feature. So again, in terms of overall condition, um, when I'm buying one of these, I look, at, I look, at, I look for things like, what's, is there motor noise? Is the, is the motor running quietly? Um, is there friction noise? Does it sound like there's something rubbing or squeaking? Um, I look for bent blades. I look to see, for instance, like when you look down, when you look down into the hopper, of the, the pug mill, you can see some of the blades, the, the blades are part of the screw. And I look down to make sure that I don't, that nothing's bent or broken, you know, from what I can see. On a pug mill, you can, you, you can actually disassemble it. So you can usually take it apart. And if, you know, if you have the option and look at the whole screw feed and see whether the screw is in the, that, that shaft with the, with the spiral on it, see if that's in good shape. Um, I look to see whether there are safety guides and safety switches on it. Most of this equipment now, the newer models have, have, have safety switches on it so that you can't stick your hand, you can't run it without having the lid closed so you can't stick your hand down into it and get your, use your fingers in, in the hopper or something like that. So I just want, so, so depending on where you're going to use it, I would want to know, does it have these safety features or not? If I'm putting it in a studio where there are going to be other people or people other than myself using it, I want to know then maybe that, does it have these other features on it or not? Um, Again, uh, what's the power required for it? Even though it might be, most of these are all 110 volts, so you plug them into the wall, but they might draw more amperage than you've got on your circuit. So for instance, on, in order to run the pug mill here, we had to put in a, a higher amperage wall outlet, a special line to it, because it was blowing every time we, we run it. It was on, just on the bare edge of blowing the circuit breaker, and if we had anything else on, it blew the circuit breaker. So what's the amperage, what's the power? If it's got a really big motor on it, it might draw more power than just your normal 110 outlet. All of these things, as far as I know, are one, or the, the smaller ones are 110 volts, but is the amperage um, you know, higher than, than what you'd have on a normal outlet? Um, if it has an air, if it has a, a vacuum system on it, I listen for air leaks. When it's closed up, you shouldn't hear any hissing. When it's closed up and the and the the vacuum pump is pumping, you shouldn't hear like, which means it's leaking. So is it tight? Is the vacuum system tight? And the other thing is, the the last thing is, is it a good size for your needs? I, I when I was in Maine and I was starting my own studio, the, I had an opportunity a couple of times to buy some really big pug mills that had come other like commercial potters, there were pottery studios that were selling them and they were buying a new one. And I could get a great deal on it, but it was much bigger than I needed. And so this is where production potters were selling, they were making their own clay bodies. And so they had, 
they were replacing their mixer mills or their pug mills, and they'd sell them really cheaply, except these things were huge, and I could get a great price on it, but I thought, I'm never going to have, you know, it'll be like, I'll turn it on, and I'll be done and turn it off, because it was, the capacity was much bigger, even though the price was great and the condition was good, um, they were much bigger than I could use, so it just wasn't practical for me to buy them, because they were really meant for a high-volume high studio, whereas I was, just, I was work, just working with my own clay. Any questions on that? And again, I'm not aware of any uh, any really sort of bad brands out there. All the ones that I've seen out there are pretty good. Um, a lot of the, over the years, it's been a long time now since the 60s and the 70s, and, and initially there was a flurry of, of manufacturers producing everything, kilns and all kinds of equipment. And those have pretty much been consolidated and oh, they've gone out of business. So most of the ones that I'm aware of that are still in business are all, you know, they're pretty good. So I can't, I wouldn't recommend one brand necessarily over another. With all of these equipment, it's really a matter of features. I think they all function pretty well, but it's the extra little features or the design maybe that you might prefer one over the other. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming today. This was great. I hope this was useful. Um, and as, as, as I mentioned in the beginning, we are going to be, we're going, we're, we're going to be as well as maybe occasionally adding new topics, um, we are going to be sort of representing um, some of the topics or all the topics we've done in the past, but this time in a more sort of logical sequence. And what we might, what, and what, one of the things Dennis is also trying to make sure is we, we'd like to get more of these topics in the past that we hadn't done any video recording of, get them recorded video as well as maybe live stream them. So we may occasionally also be doing more than once a month um, opportunities. We may, if, you know, if we can, we might, because we, we want to sort of get these into our library. Um, so we may occasionally announce like, well, okay, we're going to have a special meeting on such and such a Saturday for such and such a topic, you know, everybody's welcome again. It just will be sort of like an extra round table or an extra session. Cool. Well, okay, you thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, we really want to thank our patrons for supporting our educational efforts. And if you'd like to help us, consider becoming a patron. Go to patreon.com and look for the Potter's Round Table. We have five options, five different patronage levels that you could subscribe to. And we decided, instead of naming them the typical gold, silver, bronze, platinum, we decided to give them clay names. So the first, the first level we have is, is what we're calling a clay patron, and that's for a dollar a month. And in, in exchange, you get recognition on our patron appreciation page in, our, in all of our videos. The second level that we have, we're calling a bisque level, which is um, $5 a month. And again, you get the recognition, plus you get a Potter's Roundtable sticker that you can put on your laptop or wherever you like, or on your forehead. Um, looks like this. Um, the third level that we have is called the earthenware level. That's $10 a month. You get all the previous benefits, plus you get a transcript of any available episode that we have every month, a transcript of the, of the, of the presentations. The, the stoneware level is the next one. That's for $20 a month. You get all the previous benefits, plus you get one of our Potter's Roundtable t-shirts that looks like this. And the final level that we have is what we're calling the porcelain patron level, which is for $50 a month. And again, you get all the previous benefits. You also get a handmade by, our, by Dennis, our, our, one of our founding members here, a handmade uh, pot, Potter's Roundtable mug. So we'd appreciate any kind of support you can provide. Visit www.patreon.com and search for the Potter's Roundtable. Any amount you give will support the creation of a digital library of educational videos and podcasts to support artists, potters, and educators now and into the future. The Potter's Roundtable is brought to you by Washington Street Studios and our patrons. If you enjoy the show, please subscribe, give us a five-star review, and tell your friends. If you want to learn more about Washington Street Studios and shared studio memberships, please visit our website at www.hfclay.com. Thank you, and we'll see you again next time on the Potter's Roundtable.